Hello everyone and welcome to this new episode of Tech Pizza. This is the first video that I make with the updated branding. And the reason why I decided to change name is because, well, I had a bunch of different projects. I had a podcast that I called Tech Pizza. I had this video series that I was calling This Week in Tech. And I had a newsletter. But in the end of the day, it was always the same thing. So I decided to put everything together in a single product. So from now on, if you subscribe to the Tech Pizza newsletter, you're going to receive a weekly email every Thursday. I'm changing the day as well from Saturday to Thursday. Remember, I told you already. And you're going to be able to decide how to get updated on the world of technology. You can choose to read the newsletter and that's it, if that's what you're interested to. You can decide to listen to the news as a podcast or to watch these videos. It's pretty cool, huh? But the other reason why I decided to call this Tech Pizza is because of the deep meaning of its name. You see, in ancient Rome, philosophers were used to say, just kidding, it's just a funny name, but I want to have fun. If we are not having fun, then why bother? I hope you're going to appreciate the new branding. And now let's get started with this week's news. <laughs> Researchers at Google's AI lab DeepMind made what seems to be a good step in the direction of general artificial intelligence. Let's understand what this means. You see, most AI applications today are called narrow AI, and that's because these AI algorithms can do one thing really, really well. Let's say they can recognize images, amazing, but they can't speak, they can't understand text. Or let's say that they can understand text really well, yeah, sure, but they can't understand images. Maybe they can play video games, but they can't speak, you know, you get what I'm going with this. But now the promise of artificial intelligence is to get to something called general AI. This will be something that is able to do any sort of task, exactly like our brains. And that's the main difference between what we can do and what AI can do. Our brain can learn anything. It can learn how to play ping pong or to code artificial intelligence algorithms. Whereas AI can do one thing or another until now, it seems like. So DeepMind made an algorithm called Gato. Gato can do a lot of very different things. It can understand text, it can understand images, and it can play a bunch of different games. It can do a total of more than 600 different tasks. And on 450 tasks, Gato is better than expert humans more than half of the time, which is pretty amazing. So now the question that a lot of different scientists are talking about is whether this is actually real intelligence. Because you see, in theory, you can do the same thing by building 600 different AI algorithms and just using one or another based on the task at hand. So why is this special? Why is this better than 600 different algorithms? Well, it's better if what the algorithm learns from one task is able to be repurposed on another task. Basically, if this algorithm is better than understanding images, then an algorithm that can just understand images. Because that will mean that the algorithm has generalized. It has understood something about our world, about physics, about how objects interact with each other, that it's pretty smart and it's general. So if that's what's happening, then we are on a good path. And what Google thinks is that the only missing thing to get to general AI is scale, which means that they just need to put more data, bigger neural networks, more computing power, and they're going to get to general AI. Let's see. This is a first step. We're going to see what happens when they start to take this same approach and scale it up to even more tasks and even more data in even bigger neural networks. <laughs> Apple discontinued the iPod. And if you're interested in technology and innovation in startups, there's a lot to learn here. You see, the iPod didn't just change music, it also changed Apple. In 2002, before the iPod was introduced, Apple's revenues were around $5.8 billion. Four years later, in 2006, just the iPod was bringing Apple more than $8 billion. Basically, the iPod doubled the size of the company. But now, in 2022, the iPod doesn't make sense anymore because it has been disrupted by the iPhone. The iPhone, just in 2021, brought Apple roughly $200 billion. Billions with a B. That's an insane amount of money. And that's the lesson that you have to learn in this case. The iPod changed Apple. But Apple killed the iPod with the iPhone. Apple disrupted itself. This means that any company, even Apple, cannot set on its own success. It has to keep disrupting, keep innovating, even if that means jeopardizing its own products. And now the big question is, what is going to disrupt the iPhone? 
What is the next big thing? Let me know in the comments. In the middle of our galaxy, there's a supermassive black hole, and I'm about to show you the first picture ever taken of it. This is called Sagittarius A, and it's a supermassive black hole. Let's understand what that means, and then let's talk about how they took this picture. So there's a force called gravity, that it's a force that every object applies to everything around it because of its mass. That means that now I am attracting this guitar because I have mass and the guitar has mass. Obviously, this is a very weak force because I'm not that heavy and this guitar is not that heavy. But planet Earth, for instance, it's pretty freaking heavy, and that's why we have gravity. Because planet Earth, due to its enormous mass, is attracting us towards the center of the planet. Now, black holes are objects that are so heavy that they can even attract light. Light cannot escape. Let's make an example. I have a lamp over there that is lighting me up so you can see me better. And this light has a very tiny mass. Now, the Earth is trying to attract this particle of light, but it can't do that because it's too light and the force that the Earth is pulling the light with is too low. But in the case of a black hole, the mass of this black hole will be so big that the light coming from the lamp will be instantly sucked into this hole. Now, there's one of these holes in the center of our galaxy that has a mass of almost 4 million times the mass of our sun. And that's why it's called supermassive. If the mass is more than 1 million times the mass of the sun, it's a supermassive black hole. Now, the interesting thing is that to take a picture of this, scientists had to work together across all different continents because it's really hard to take pictures of that black hole. And so what they did is that they took a lot of different pictures from different radio observatories spread all around the planet. Then they had to take all these images. It was terabytes and terabytes of data collect them and merge them together to get this single picture that you're looking at. It's pretty cool, huh? MasterCard will allow you to pay in stores using your face or the palm of your hands. A lot of you may think, well, this looks like Apple Pay, but it's fundamentally different and I think really dangerous. Let's understand first how face recognition works and why Apple and MasterCard are really not the same thing. All these face recognition algorithms work in this way. You take a picture of your face and a neural network transforms your image into a bunch of numbers called a token or an embedding. Now, these numbers make no sense for a human being, but they are unique identifiers for your face. And AI algorithms can use these numbers to identify who this person is. And now this is the biggest difference between Apple and MasterCard. When you use Face ID on your phone, this series of numbers that represents your face is stored on your phone. Apple doesn't know it. Nobody else outside of your phone has the little series of numbers called a token. With MasterCard instead, since they don't have a device, what happens is that they, MasterCard, in their own centralized servers, have your token. They have that string of numbers that represents your face. Now, MasterCard says, well, this doesn't matter because it's not a picture of your face, it's just a series of random numbers. But that's not true, because that series of random numbers is a unique identifier of who you are. And MasterCard can recognize you in every context, even if you don't want to. And since it's centralized, people can hack MasterCard and potentially steal your biometric information. So why the hell did they do that? They said because of two reasons, and I'm gonna tell you why it's bullshit. The first one is that they said that consumers love biometric data. Sure, when it's on their device and when they know that their data is safe, but when it's on your servers and when your data may be compromised, well, maybe consumers don't like that, huh? And the second reason is that they said that this is to get ready for the metaverse. Now, I don't understand what the metaverse has to do with this, to be honest, really. They're already trialing this system in some stores in Brazil, and there are real stores. They're not metaverse stores. I, I think this does not make sense, so I'll tell you the real reason why they invested in this. They invested in this because Apple and Google, they're taking away power from them. They're taking control of the global financial payment system. Right now, I think I never use my credit card. I use Apple Pay. And a lot of my friends do the same with Google Pay or Apple Pay or whatever. And considering the amount of money that Google and Apple set on, it's not hard to imagine them replacing MasterCard and Visa and just becoming basically a payment processor or even a 
bank. Apple has something like $200 billion in cash reserves. It, it could be a bank tomorrow, really. What do you think about this? Do you love biometric identification or not? Let me know in the comments. <music> NFTs are not decentralized today. Let me explain with a couple of stories. The first one is about Mark Honan, the editor-in-chief at MIT Technology Review. He wanted to purchase an NFT of Olive Garden, the famous pseudo-Italian restaurant in the United States. So he went on OpenSea, the leading NFT trading platform, and decided to buy one. This was $20, he ended up paying $300 because of gas fees and because the price went up, but that's not the point of the story. The point of the story is that the person who made this NFT is not Olive Garden, it's just a guy who decided to put pictures of Olive Garden stores on NFTs and sell them. Which is fine for me, but it's not fine for Olive Garden. Their attorney sent an email to OpenSea and said that they had to take away this NFT collection because they were using their brand and this was a copyright infringement. And in theory, NFTs are decentralized, which means that you cannot really control what's on the blockchain and what gets sold and what gets bought. But in practice, since everybody uses OpenSea, OpenSea had to oblige to what Olive Garden asked and they took the NFTs away from the platform. So does this look like something that is decentralized or does it look like a centralized exchange? And that's actually the direction that OpenSea is going towards because you know that there's a lot of scams in the NFT space. You know that I've been talking about this for months. And what NFT is doing to protect consumers is first of all, trying to understand what are real and fake NFTs, which means that a centralized authority is gonna decide what is true and what gets sold and what doesn't. Sounds pretty centralized to me. And the other thing is that they're gonna start to verify and add verified badges to people that have collections worth more than roughly $200,000, so 100 Ether, which also sounds pretty centralized to me. What is the difference between these and Christie's or any other art exchange? Honestly, the difference is starting to blur. There is one big difference though. OpenSea, it's about crypto. And so it's about Ether, it's about Solana, it's about Bitcoin, whatever. Christie's on the other hand, it's about solid US dollars. And so people who wanna spend crypto are usually not interested in the same stuff that people who wanna spend US dollars are interested in. So to me, what's happening is really, we are creating a parallel financial system that is in the end, pretty much the same as the other one, but with different money, which I guess is cool. I'm really confused about this whole NFT thing. I mean, it's cool, but a lot of the promises are just not true. What do you think about it? Thank you for watching this episode of Tech Pizza, the easiest way for busy people to stay up to date on the crazy world of technology. If you like this episode, you remember that you can subscribe on techpizza.live by putting your email every Thursday. You're going to receive in your inbox a newsletter where you can read about the news and everything that happened in tech, or you can listen to it as a podcast or watch it as a video. So go on techpizza.live, put your email, and I'm going to see you next Thursday in your inbox. Ciao!